following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The rune Wunjo is a rune of wun joy, the rune of bliss, happiness, joy, and uh, it resembles the letter P of the Latin alphabet and the letter Rho of the Greek alphabet. If you observe the graphics that are in the website where uh, you can click there and have all the graphics that we are going to show today, which indeed are not too many. So we placed the face of Tonatiu again in between the different symbols of this rune in order to show you that also is hidden within the face of Tonatiu, <coughs> the fifth sun of the Aztec calendar. If you observe, you will see that this rune hides precisely in the tongue, being the line in between the mouth of Tonatiu and the tongue, the triangular aspect of the rune, which is related with the wind, with what in English we say, wind, an expression that means to go. And uh, it's also related with the breath, as you can see, or the wind that emanates from the tongue of Tonatiu, which brings joy. Related, of course, with the word. If uh, you are observant, you will see that this rune resembles also the rune thorn. But do not mistake it. The rune thorn has the thorn, the angle in between the line. Precisely as you see here in the tongue of Tonatiu, which is in between the line, the horizontal line. While uh, the rune uh, Wunjo is precisely at the very end of the tap of the vertical line or at the very end, the extreme of uh, the horizontal line of uh, the, uh, the symbol. But uh, by using our imagination, of course, we see that that rune relates to the mouth, the center, 
which is the word, that many times we have stated relates to the three primary forces that we were explaining very widely in the previous lecture. Yet today, we are going to uh, enter into the topic of this uh, rune, which relates with joy. In the very bottom of, the, of this uh, face of Tonatiu, you find the rune uh, Wunjo in between the rune Gebo which is also called Gebor or Gebur, which is the X. If you remember this symbol of the Lord Christ in the Greek uh, alphabet, they symbolize the Lord Christ with the X, which is the key, the letter Ki or Chi of uh, Greek alphabet, and the letter Rho, which is a P in the Latin alphabet, in order to uh, point to the first letters of the word Christ. And uh, we also find this marvelous symbol in the Nordic alphabet, the Gebel, which is the X, and the P, which is the Wunjo which is, of course, the joy or the bliss of the Lord, the fire that emerges from the X, <coughs> from the marvelous swastika that we explained very widely in previous lectures. With this, of course, we have to understand that every rune relates to another because the rune are the symbols that uh, emerge from the word of God from that language that we stated is the golden language in which from uh, I mean symbols the runic symbols which are the root of the Hebrew alphabet Latin alphabet and Greek alphabet Many other alphabets. There's a very ancient, primeval alphabet that is enclosed, of course, in the Aztec calendar, made by the same masters that uh, knew about this cryptic alphabet that we are studying from the Gnostic point of view. According to this rune, you see that has the same uh, forces or the same aspect of uh, oh yes, I'm doing the wrong one. of this uh, circle that uh, we were showing in the previous lecture related with Shen, Qi, and Jing, which are these three uh, energies that circulate in a circle and uh, that emanate, as we have stated, from the unknowable divine. And uh, also we have stated and we've shown that uh, this, this is uh, a symbol also in the very center of that uh, Dharma wheel of Buddhism. And if you observe the rune Wunjo, you will see that it has also one, two, three in the, very, uh, in the runic uh, aspect. The three forces there united. One, two, three. But if you observe the first line, the vertical line of the Rune Wunjo, you will, you will understand that the first force that is called Shen, that in Kabbalah is called Keter, emerges from another force that in the previous lecture we called the Ein Sof. 
And this is precisely what we have to understand when we see this vertical line. But it's precisely a line that shows us the Ains of, which is our own particular star, the very bottom of our own being, <coughs> and from it emanates what in Kabbalah is called Keter. And from Keter emanates Chokhmah, which is the sun, and Binah, which is the Holy Spirit, making, of course, the three primary forces within the, the absolute abstract Ein Sof, which is joy. In other words, this marvelous rune encloses four forces, as you can see, one invisible and three visible. Again, the famous tetragrammaton, which in Kabbalah is uh, explained with the first triangle of the tree of life, Keter Chokma Bina, that emerges from the Ein Sof. When we study the Zohar, which is the pure Kabbalah, the masters or rabbis, as we say in Hebrew, explain there that the great face that in this case is in the center of the Aztec calendar, the great face called Keter, only shows the right side, that side which is related with the universe. Because the left is hidden. And the left, of course, is that uh, part that relates to the Ein Sof. In other words, in order for us to experience what is the Ein Sof inside of us, we had to go directly to Keter, which is his, its visible aspect. Because the Ein Sof is the invisible aspect of God. From the Ein Sof emerges that which in the previous lecture we call A Elohim, the city, which is dark fire, a light that is possible to see only in a state of. Samari, in a state of bliss, in a state of joy. And that's precisely what this rune encloses. Because the Ein Sof is the very root <coughs> of everything what, that we are. The Buddha stated that there are three eternal things in the universe. And they, uh, these are the space, nirvana and karma, which is precisely the cause of the universe. Karma is a law or a force that remains in repose within the Ein Sof, within that abstract space, within that bliss that is also called Paranirvana, which is beyond the nirvana, which is in the universe. This is what also another term that we had to uh, comprehend in this uh, lecture. Nirvana, which is eternal in the space, I mean in the universe, beyond that is paranirvana, which is also a, a synonym of paranishpana, related always with the absolute. 
And uh, in Hinduism, they call it also Parabrahma. Parabrahma. So Brahma, in Hinduism, is the universal spirit of life. Parabrahma is beyond that. It's the abstract space. And uh, this rune teaches that mystery. Which is expressed in the Aztec calendar. That's why we have to observe the Aztec calendar in order to comprehend why we always state that Tonatiu is the fifth sun. We explain that because around the circle of Tonatiu we find the other four squares that uh, point us to the previous four suns or the four elements or suns that existed before this present sun which is the fifth but if we go deep into this study of the rune Wunjo we discover that it relates to the Ainsoff and the three primary forces and the three primary forces of these three lines of the rune Wunjo relate to the three main elements which are eternal or three things we will say which are eternal which are the space nirvana and karma karma is the origin of the universe the universe exists because of karma cause and effect and of course Karma, as a law, among the numbers, is represented by the number five. The number five that relates, of course, to Tonatiu. That's why we said it's the fifth sun, but it's also related to the fifth force, which is karma, which is the origin of the universe. This planet Earth, and any planet, this solar system, and any solar system, this galaxy, and any galaxy, has its origin in karma, cause and effect. And that's why the ones that uh, chiseled this marvelous stone, the Aztec calendar, they placed the fifth sun in the middle, pointing that karma, the number five, is the origin of everything, even the origin of our own particular individual existence. The law of karma is represented in this uh, uh, solar system by this god or monad that was uh, worshipped in Egypt, Anubis, and that now in this day and age is uh, vulgarized in many Hollywood movies. Anubis is a great being that exists in the superior dimensions of nature and rules that law. But of course, when you examine the tree of life, you discover that the fifth sephirah among the ten sephiroth of the tree of life is called Gebura, which is called Justice, which is the fifth sun. And uh, that's why uh, we are now in the fifth root race ruled by the fifth sun, which relates also with karma. And from that point of view, we have to understand the relation of this law with the numbers. Because when we go into the study of the seven sons, 
we discovered that the fourth, which is Michael, the Logos of the Son, he is also related with justice. He's also related with the law. We have stated in previous lectures that the Son, as you end, is related with that law which is come, uh, I mean called the cosmic common trogo auto egocrat law. The law that means the reciprocal nourishment of all the unities in the universe. That law acts according to karma, according to the law of the scale, in different levels, in different kingdoms. But also Gebura, or as we explained in the previous lectures, in our physicality, Gebura is related with that systole diastole, the power, the mighty force that contracts and extends and that flows the blood in our organism. If we understand that, if we comprehend that, we have to understand also that that Gebura, the fifth son, relates to that force that emanates from the absolute and that contracts and expands with these two laws that we call in previous lectures the cosmic day and the cosmic night Mahabambantara and Mahapralaya in the previous aspect I mean in the macrocosmic aspect if you observe yourself related with this lecture, we will state that right now, since we are alive physically, we are in our own particular individual Mamantara, cosmic day. Because remember that Maha means great. So Mamantara is cosmic day. Maha Mamantara, great cosmic day. But we are now in our own particular Mambantara. When we die, because ev eventually we will die, then we will enter in our own particular Paralaya. And that's precisely the rhythm of the force of the fifth sun that gives and takes in different levels. Just physically, we are explaining this in order to comprehend, because also, as I said, explains that uh, that is explained in our own physicality. When we talk about this uh, fifth sun, we have to understand that it acts through the tongue, through the logos, the trinity and that it acts according to the law of the absolute. We had to state then, then in our own particular heaven, our own particular spiritual or spirituality related with the tree of life, we find two sons. The son related to Tifereth, that relates to the fourth son, and the son related to Gebura, which is the fifth. Both sons relate to the blood, to the power of life. And this is how you have to comprehend and understand it, or them. To understand the force of the fifth sun. And if you observe, of course, that's why from the pass of Tonatiu, which is the fifth, Gebura, he measures the two mighty claws that squeeze Tifereth, which is a heart. 
as we explained in previous lecture, forces the heart to work with his power of systole, diastole. Obviously, Kebura is beyond Tifereth, but both of them are one force working together. And that's why when we go into our heart, we have to concentrate in that mighty force that gives us willpower, which is Gebura, in order for us to acquire what we need to acquire spiritually. And of course, if you observe the sign of the Aztec calendar in the very center, you find the Gebo, rune Gebo, and that rune Wunjo in the center. If you move the sun, of course, towards the right in order to see it clearly, which is again the same symbol of Christ. The X and the Rho, or the Chi and the Rho of the Greek alphabet, which is a symbol of the Lord. Inactivity. This means that the powerful force of the Ein Sof has to be active through the three primary forces of the universe which in our physicality are related with uh, three brains. And of course, these three brains, as you can see, are located along the spinal column, which is that vertical lined of the rune bunjo and that is uh, and the three brains are related of course with that thorn or triangle above uh, the rune in this way we have to see it why above because in the brain we have the three atoms that connect to these three parts of the body. Remember that we always stated that the atom of the father is in the magnetic root of the nose. The atom of the son is in the pituitary gland and the atom of the Holy Spirit in the pineal gland. That is a triangle that makes that uh, triangle above the rune Wunjo that can give us joy, the bliss, or the experience of Samadhi. If we know how to enlighten the vertical line related with our spine. in order for the three brains to nourish these three atoms which are related with it or with them and to put into activity the chakra sahasrara which is called the crown chakra this uh, crown chakra is related also with the Ain Saf, with our own particular individuality. If you observe then, all the runes relate to this mysterious stone that show us not only the prophecies related with the different root races that existed, four that existed already, and the fifth that exists, and two that will exist in the future, but also relates to different forces in relation with the manifestation of 
the universe that we have to know how to handle with a sign of alchemy. So, the three forces that act to our three brains and also in the universe relate to the three energies which in Taoism we name Shen, Qi, and Jin. That we need to handle, to manipulate in different uh, practices, forces that we perform in order for us to have the joy of any type of samadhi, any type of experience out of the body. That's why it is necessary to, to know that every energy related with Shen Chi of Jin, alchemy, is indispensable in order for us to experience any of these uh, uh, elements or archetypes that we have within and that we have been spoken about in different lectures. We were explaining only how the energies relate to our systems and how those archetypes are within us. But it is necessary for us to have the joy, the pleasure of experiencing these archetypes within us, which are parts of our being. Because this lecture go into our intellect in order for us to comprehend how the being, the spirit, our own particular individuality relates to these archetypes. But only in the intellect to comprehend that is not enough. We have to have access to a practical ac uh, aspect of this. And of course, this uh, rune is related with that that we call meditation. It's only by means of the technique of meditation that we can experience these uh, elements that all of us have within that we need to develop. Master Samael on Veor in the book of runes give us an explanation about the Ain Saf. He stated beyond the organic machine, our physical body, and the three aspects that manifest themselves through it, many substances, forces, and spiritual principles exist that emanate from the Ain Saf. Now listen. When we talk about the Ain Saf, we said it's in relation with the pineal gland. But if we understand that from the Ains of emerges the ray of Okivanok, which is that light that we were explaining in the previous lecture, which is called the Sun, the Christ, and that relates to the Ains of or the solar absolute, then we have to comprehend that the Ains of or relates to the sexual organs. 
Because remember that from the Ain Sof, which relates to the Sahasrara Chakra, the Crown Chakra, from that emanates the three primary forces that we explain relates to the tree of life, the ray of creation. And in the tree of life, you see how from the Ain Sof emerges the Ain Sof or and then through Keter, and then Chokhmah, Bina, Chesed, Gebura, Tiferet, Netza, Hod, Yesod, and finally Malkut. But in Malkut, it goes directly into the very center of the earth, the ninth sphere. And the ninth sphere of the center of the earth is directly related with the Yesod as sexual organs. That's why when we name Yesod, we said the sexual organs. When we go beyond, we said it's the very center of our own particularity. But Yesod is also related with our own vital body that is called ethereal body. And this is something that you have to grasp in order to comprehend these symbols because this uh, tree of life synthesizes a lot. Only by using our intuition is how we grasp it. So then the, the end of the ray of creation is in the ninth sphere, in the very center of the earth. And that ninth sphere relates to Yesod. So there is the very end of the ray of creation that emerges from the Ain Sof. In other words, the Ain Sof or ends in the very center of the planet Earth, which is our own, it relates to our own sexuality. That's why when we said the Ain Sof or is the same Christ, and Yesod is the Christic Christ. The Christic force, the Christic light that we have in our sexual organs. So understand that. That the Ain of Or, which is called the Cosmic Christ, has to return to his own origin. And in that return is what we call the transmutation, the sublimation of the Lord, of the Christ. In order for us to go back into the Ain Sof, self-realized. Because that cosmic ray, the ray of creation, creates according to karma when it descends. But when it ascends, when it returns to the Ain Sof, it creates according to willpower, according to our own individual force, our own consciousness. And then in that way we accomplish with that famous law which is called the Cosmic Common Trogo Auto Egocrat in which we feed our own particular aims of with our own particular work of alchemy. The work that we have to perform with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. Because that is precisely what the rune of joy, Wunjo, is showing us. That we have to use the science of breath the wind, in order to navigate in a spinal column to those different islands, chakras, as Odysseus and the Odyssey of Homer, in order to return to our own particular island here in the Pina Land. And to do the great work. 
along the journey, Neptune is going to test us. Remember that Neptune, the lower of the waters, is the symbol of Bina, the Holy Spirit. Which is the origin of the world. Beasts, gods, and human beings. So to return that force of the ends of or from the sex up to the pineal gland is a work that every initial has to perform. But since the Holy Spirit is the one that controls from the pineal gland the sexual organs, who is Neptune in Greek mythology, or let us say uh, Roman, because among the Greek is Poseidon. The same Poseidon of uh, Neptune controls the waters, sexual waters, with all the fish, the sperm and the ovum, our life, that we had to transmute. And that's precisely hidden in the story of Odysseus. In all those uh, mythologies that we find uh, in different parts of the world. The trident of Neptune relates also to this marvelous rune. If you observe the rune and the triangle up on top of it, if you open the triangle, well, then you make a trident. A trident which symbolizes the man with open arms, with the head in the middle, which is called the rune man. <coughs> so the rune man, the trident, standing represents or is associated also with this ruined window that we have to work with because we always state that we have to work with the three factors not two three those three factors are necessary the first factor it's called chastity, transmutation of the sexual libido from Yesod up to Keter in order to create the four bodies, solar bodies of the human being. The body of liberation, which is called the physical body, together with the vital body, it's an immortal physical body that is represented by the hydrogen. Then the, above it, we have to create the astral body, which is represented by the nitrogen. Then the mental body, which is represented by the oxygen. And on top of them, the causal, which is related with the carbon. Carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, together with the hydrogen, are the four seed atoms that we need to create. Or that the of, which is our own particular atomic star, needs to have in order to return victorious into the bosom of the Father, the Ain. Remember that the Ain is beyond the Ain Sof. We have our own particular Ain Sof. And if we want to enter into the bosom of the Ain, which is the unmanifested Father, we need to have hydrogen, Carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen within our own particular ain't self. 
Because in alchemy or in Kabbalah, we know that every single Ein Sof, because each one of us has its own, has three atoms or primary atoms related with the three primary forces, Keter, Chochmah, Binah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Olin, Balder, Thor, in the Nordic alphabet, or the Eda. And of course, in Taoism, as we were explaining, Shen, Qi, and Yin. Those forces are there within the Ein Sof, waiting for us to put them into activity. But in order for them to be in activity, they have to descend from the abstract space into our own physicality. The physical body becomes the temple within which the three, these three forces work. In our three brains. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are inside as forces, as energies. Then we need to work and that we work with the three factors and every factor, we work with the three of them. In order to have the joy or to be born again, as the Gospels state, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it is necessary to be born again. Only the ray of creation can create within us the necessary vehicles which are these four seed atoms that we are talking about, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, that give us access to the kingdom of heaven. That means to create internal bodies with the creative energy of Poseidon, the Holy Spirit. To be born again, as Master Jesus explains in the Gospels, it's not a matter of believing or belonging to any sect. It's a matter of putting into activity the three primary forces from our physicality. Because the physicality that we have is what is called Adama. Adama in Hebrew, which is translated as the ground in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, it is stated that the Elohim, Jehovah, created Adam from the dust of Adama, from the dust of the ground. That, of course, relates directly to our physicality. Adama is our physicality. And that Adam has to emerge from that physicality by means of alchemy that is to be born again. Because what is born from the flesh is flesh. And what is born from the spirit is a spirit. It is necessary to be born by the water and the spirit. And we explain that the water are the waters of Poseidon, the sexual waters, creative waters that had to be controlled by our own particular spirit. That spirit is Gedula, Chesed. That is our own particular monad. Or our own particular individuality. That monad, that individuality is connected to the ray of creation, to the ends of all, in the sexual organs. In order for our own individuality, our own mona, our own spirit, to create those bodies inside of us, he needs to descend to the ninth sphere, to Yesod, 
and to work with the fires of the Ainsaf. He needs to be encountered with the absolute abstract space, with that light which is the Ainsaf or which is in our sexual organs. And from there, the Ains of Or works through the three primary forces. When that individual is connected, if he's a man with a wife, in the sexual act become the neutral force, the three primary forces working in alchemy, in order to create, in order to work with a, three, uh, with a factor called to be born again. And in order to die, which is the second factor, why is this the second factor? Well, let us remind you, uh, re re remind you uh, in the Gospels of Jesus Christ. He said, Whosoever wants to come after me, deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. The three factors. The cross is a symbol of the gebo, in which if we place the wound, wunjo, that give us the joy of to be born again. That's the cross. But to deny ourselves also implies the three forces. It always implies that we were uh, talking previously the lecture with this uh, friend. He says, if virtue is positive and uh, defect is negative, what is a neutral force? In the factor dying, there are the three forces there. The virtue is the one that we want to conquer. But remember that the virtue has to be cogn co virtue with cognizance, which we synthesize in love. Love is a law, but love with cognizance. Obviously, the defect, which is the opposite of the virtue, is something that shouldn't exist, but exists, unfortunately, inside of us. So what is the neutral force that we need in order to concile the defect with the virtue that we need, the consciousness which is trapped into the defect. How do you call that neutral force that will give access to the awakening of the consciousness? It is called comprehension. We need to comprehend. It's not ju just by denying ourselves fanatically. That we are going to die psychologically. It's comprehension the one that we need. Because we have sometimes virtues that we don't know how to use. They use them mechanically. So that's why meditation is a technique that you need in order to comprehend. And of course... In the giving, the third factor, which is called sacrifice for humanity, charity, which the Lord calls follow me, because the law of the Lord is sacrifice, is also the three factors. You are there, the passive factor, which are listening to my active factor. I am giving the lecture, I am affirming here, and you are listening. You are in a passive uh, level. So we need a conciliated force, conciliating force that will unite my lecture with your listening. And that is called questions, doubts, in order to unite this with your consciousness, in order for this lecture to have effect, the third factor. I remember a long time ago, 
when the Master Samael owned the ore, still was physically alive, this wa uh, there was this individual that uh, was also boasting of being awake internally and accusing others of being asleep. And he was saying, and I know that because I am awakened. I found such a such fellow very asleep in the internal planes. Everybody believed him because nobody had the capacity of investigating what he was affirming. I asked him, what do we have to do in order to awake in the internal planes? And he said, work with the three factors and do not follow anyone. This is, this is your advice. Yes, don't follow anybody. Well, if I have to follow that advice, I don't have to follow you. Because you are that too. Right? But if you want to exactly comprehend the three factors, to which in in certain, certain way the statement was right. Work with the three factors, yes. And he said, and don't follow anybody. Wrong. We have to follow Christ. Because by ourselves, we cannot do it. Don't follow anybody. What, what is that? No, we have to follow Christ. We have to follow the avatar. The one that is connected with the Lord. That's why the Master Samael delivered his books and wrote his books. In order for us to comprehend the doctrine. He is one with the Lord. So the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness are hidden within this joy. Because by working with deny yourself, take daily your cross and follow me, the third factor, is the joy of entering into the kingdom of heaven. But remember, we have to follow the Lord. Follow me, said the cosmic Christ through the lips of Master Jesus of Nazareth. Who represents the cosmic Christ in the planet Earth, in the Bible? So that's why the Master Samael on the Earth, who is one with the Lord, with the cosmic Christ, said, "Beyond the organic machine, physical body, and the three aspects that manifest themselves through it, many substances, forces, and spiritual principles exist that emanate from the end of." And they exist inside of us. It exists outside, yes, but inside of us are the ones that we have to utilize. As a final synthesis, exists there. But what is the aim of? We answer in an abstract way when saying, the aim of is the absolute nothing within, without limits. The absolute nothing without limits. What is the nothing? It's something that is not a thing in the universe. But it's something in the abstract. It's our own individuality. Nonetheless, it is necessary to be precise and concrete in order to comprehend the aims of it is our divine atom, which is singular, special, specific, genuine, and super individual. This definition signifies that in the final synthesis, each of us is nothing more than an atom from the abstract absolute space. The interior atomic star that has always smiled upon us. A certain author said, I raise my eyes toward the utmost, toward the stars, from which for me all help has to come. But I always follow the guidance of my inner star. And that inner star, of course, is our own particular in self. But remember that before relying on our own particular star, we need to... Uh, 
be loyal, faithful to our own guru or master. In this case, the master Samael on the or. Because he is the one that is helping us in the internal planes. We are not alone. We explain here through our lectures the doctrine. And you read the doctrine in the different books of the Master Samael on the Or, who have uh, the joy, has the joy of being one with the cosmic Christ. He's a self realized master. When we state this, people always ask us, why do you say that the Master Samaelon Vior is one the, with the Cosmic Christ? Because you read it in his books? And said, yeah, your question is really relevant. Obviously, he explained in the, his different books how he attained the union with the uh, uh, Cosmic Christ. Not only in this cosmic day, but in previous cosmic days. But personally, of course, if I talk with a lot of emphasis, it's because I experienced through the clues and practices, exercises that the Master Samael gave us in Mexico, the truth that we are talking about here. Thanks to him, we comprehend many things because we are uh, experiencing, practicing, and we give faith. But also, we want you to have that faith, that security in this doctrine. And that is only attained when you experience directly what the Master Samael taught in his books. Let us continue reading what he said in the book of runes. And after that, I will explain to you my own particular experience related with what he's talking about. He said, it is clear that this super divine atom is not incarnated but yet is found to be intimately related with the chakra Sahasrara, the lotus of 1,000 petals, the magnetic center of the pineal gland. I have directly experienced the Ein Sof while in the state of very profound meditation. One day, the date and hour doesn't matter, I attained that state that is in India is known as Nirvi Kalpa Samari, where my soul was totally absorbed within the Ain Sof, enabled to travel through the abstract absolute space. This journey started in my pineal gland and continued within the profound bosom of the eternal space. Thus, I saw myself beyond any galaxy of matter or antimatter. I was simply converted into a self-conscious atom. How happy I was while in the absence of the I, beyond this world, beyond the mind, beyond the stars and anti-stars. What one feels during the experience of Samadhi is unutterable. It is comprehensible only through experimentation. If we practice what he teaches. So I entered through the doors of a temple while inebriated with ecstasy, and then I saw and heard things that the intellectual animals are not allowed to comprehend. I wanted to converse with a divine priest, and it is obvious that I achieved it so that I could console my painful heart. One among many of those self-realized atoms from the Ain Sof, the abstract absolute space, increased its size and assumed the venerated figure 
of an elder of days before my unusual presence. Then, spontaneously, the spontaneous word that resounded within the infinite space emerged from my creative larynx, and I consulted about someone I knew in the world of dense forms. The answer from this very illustrious atomic master was certainly extraordinary. He said, The mind is for us, the inhabitants of the Ain Sof, what the mineral kingdom is for you. And he added, Therefore, we examine the human mind in the same way you examine any mineral. In the name of the truth, I have to say that such an answer caused me great amazement, admiration, astonishment, and surprise. Samael on Bill. As you see here, the Martyr states that through meditation, you can enter into Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Any one of us can do it. And when I said that, it's because I experienced exactly the same that the master experienced. In the state of meditation, I enter into that state as well. Now my experience was not the same. I follow the same rules that he commands in his books and that he personally taught me in order to experience with my own particular aims. So what I wanted is want to face my own particular aims of. And certainly I achieve it. In the same way I enter into the abstract, abstract space. And from there, my only and particular atom or star emerged in front of me. He didn't talk. In this case, I was a stone before my own individuality there in that abstract space. Then he, he also didn't talk. He just moved his hand and made to emerge from the nothingness a table. I saw the table. And from the nothingness, he also made to emerge a piece of paper and a pencil. Then I understood something is going to happen here or to be written in that blank paper with a pencil. And he did exactly, he advanced. And he looked at me in silence. And he wrote in the piece of paper, Be careful with mitomania. And then the paper disappeared, the pencil disappeared, the table disappeared, and he returned, and everything was again nothingness. And then I returned to my physical body. Since that time, I couldn't forget that. Because what the Master explains there in this uh, book of runes is the exact thing I experience. But what I received there, because the Master at that time want, wanted to know about certain individual that need to, to be assisted. He need the assistance of any atom of the Ain Sof in order to do what he has to do. If you buy the book, book of runes, you will understand what I'm talking about. But the thing is this, that my own particular aim self warned me against mitomania. That table that appeared there, I understood, relates to the Sephiroth, Netzah, Hod, Yasod, and Malkut what we call the inferior quaternary that is related with a terrestrial man. In other words, with me. The one that is here in front of you. 
physical body, vital body, emotional body in my mind that I'm using now in order to teach this. But of course, the one that experienced that was my consciousness, not my mind. My mind received the information after I returned into my, my physicality. Then I understood that uh, I had to control my, my own particular mind, my own particular terrestrial mind, matter, in order not to fall into mythomania. You see, this word myth, of course, we talk about myth here different times, explaining the different myths of different religions and philosophies. Manas, or mania, the mind. But in this case, mythomania is related to the mind that boasts about knowing the mysteries. Sometimes it says that myth means to lie, or the mind that lies. So what is that mind that lies? Of course, it's a tendency that all of us, the Gnostics, and every esoteric group has to boast about things that relate to the spirit. Sometimes we have a cert certain experiences and we think that we already are masters without understanding that mastery is only related with chesed, with our own particular spirit. And the mind is only an instrument. The astral body is only an instrument. And the physicality is also an instrument within which we have the personality. So, of course, since that time, I observe not only my own particular individuality, but the other individualities of other persons that boast too much about themselves. If I am telling you about this experience, it's because it's directly to, it's, it's against me. It's not something that is going to edify me in relation with my personality, but to decline me. Because he, my, my inner star said, be careful with mythomania. Because this is precisely the problem among many Gnostics, mythomania. That they boast too much about their being. Having the ego alive is very bad. Because this rune, Wunjo, has also the negative aspect, which is that pleasure, egotistical pleasure, mundane pleasure, that the ego acquires through pride to the mind, boasting always that we are this or we are that. Of course, to experience things, is necessary, but not to boast about that. Because we fall in the danger of becoming mythomaniac. Thinking that the one that is uh, capable of unveiling the mysteries is us. In my case, for instance, I always meditate, because through meditation I discover many things. I have the bliss the joy, the wound of having that. But I always remember that warning from my particular star, in which I have to understand and comprehend that it's not me. In this moment, it's coming into my mind, Odysseus. When he is boasting about the conquering of Troy, and then when Poseidon listened to his boasting, he starts, okay, you are insulting the gods because you are boasting of something that you didn't do. We did it. Right? And then when he is 
and all these troubles in his journey to the pineal gland, to the return of the, of the union, he says, why are you treating me like this? And then Poseidon says, because you have to understand that men without the gods, they are nothing. So without the gods, men are nothing. And that is referring to, to the mind, you know what I mean? When one boasts of something, oh, this is because I did it, or because we did it, whatever. No. We are just vehicles. Somebody I heard sometimes uh, in the internal planes, it says, such and such master, or such and such monad, is acting through these hands. And I was seeing the hands. And it happens that those hands were the hands of somebody else. It means that that individual was the vehicle of that master. But it was not the master. And this is something that you have to comprehend and understand. Do not mistake the personality and the physicality with the inner being with the aim of the, the three primary forces. Because that is the, 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 the very depth of our own divine element. The aim of and the three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is our own divine element. But below that, just vehicles. Even our own monad is a vehicle of the Lord. But beyond that or below that is the table, the square, When you sit, you said, I'm going to sit at the table. The being says, I'm going to sit on my table. And what is the table? It's you. You have to serve him. Then you bend and says, yeah, I'm your table. Write whatever you want to write. And he writes, be careful with me, Tomania. Don't think that because I'm writing on your back, because I am giving the lecture through your mouth, that you are the one that is doing it. Comprehend that. Understand that. And have the joy of being one with me. Because when one falls in the, in, into the heresy of separativity, meaning that one, be, believing that one is the one and not the being, and then we fall into mythomania. As we said in previous lectures, you don't need, uh, in order to be mythomaniac, you, you don't need to, uh, not, not to reach the mastery. I mean, people think that only the masters are not mythomaniacs. <coughs> but we have to understand that even a master, the mind of a master, can become mythomaniac. Now that I'm saying this, in order for you to understand, it's coming into my mind also in Mexico, when we were with the Master Samael on the Or. This was this individual who knew that was a fallen bodhisattva. And the master also corroborated to him that he was a fallen bodhisattva. I mean, a vehicle of a master in ancient times, but now he was fallen. And he was in every single lecture where we were with the master, asking, but a bodhisattva, this and that, our master, that he has the ability and, and is more in contact because he did the work in past lives, so, he is capable of comprehending more the knowledge than the ordinary people. And the master said, yeah, it's right, and blah, 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 blah. Next reunion of the third chamber with the master Zamael, again, the same individual, asking the same thing, and the master explaining in different ways, but always trying to point, A, I am a fallen bodhisattva. So be aware of that. You know what I mean? And then the, the last time that he asked, I remember the Master Samael stood, because he was always seated, giving the lecture, he stood and says, Okay, let us stop this mythomania, he said, because it's not good. Even I hear, he says, by repeating and explaining things, because I am also a bodhisattva, I don't want to fall into mythomania. So let us not to fall into mythomania. Or to, to boast about ourselves too much. 
It is only necessary to talk about what we need to talk. But to understand what is pleasure, joy, and bliss inside, and how the ego can take that and mingle inside of us, that ruin and thinking that, oh, I am great because people admire me, or because people think that I am a wise man. Because that is also mythomania. I have uh, said uh, many, many groups. In a group, there are a lot of people. This, this, and that, you know. And there are like, thousands. So that's mythomania. Feeling proud. Boasting about something. If there is a lot of people or listening to the lecture or, or knowing this doctrine... It's because each one of us is guided by his own star. He's pushing us to the doctrine. And we are just organizers, helping people to follow themselves. <coughs> also, as I said one time to this other Gnostic, if we had to follow somebody, we had to follow Samael on the or, who has no ego. Below him is a lot. And uh, another anecdote that relates to this joy or this ruin. In the north of Mexico, I was seated in front of the Master Samuel Veor that was with his wife at that time, the Master Little Antis. And because I was concerned about many things that he told me in private, I asked him, Master, tell me frankly, am I a Hanasmus? And he said, yeah, you are. Well, nothing new for me. <laughs> and then the, the Master of Atlantis, Look at him and said, All of us are Hannah's Musen. And all of us are helping you to spread the doctrine in the world. The Hannah's Musen are helping you, she said. And then the master said, It's true. Hannah's Musen are helping me to spread the doctrine. All over the world. But doesn't take the fact that they are Hanas Muslim. <laughs> and it's true. And I said, says, well, Master, at least we know that all of us are Hanas Muslim. But to wake with double center of gravity, and then he says, that, that's different. To be a Hanas Mus with double center of gravity, that's very grave. Because then you awaken evil and for evil, and at the same time your being is a master. So this is what we have to understand. We can fall into the double center of gravity if we boss too much about our own being. And people... Do it because of the fact that the master did it. I mean, he didn't boast. He was commanded because he is the avatar to write and to say things that the ordinary initiate don't say. If you follow, for instance, uh, uh, and listen to the Dalai Lama, you just sit down and says, if you come here because I want to heal you, you are wrong because I'm not a healer. And if you ask me, who am I? Well, I am a simple monk. This is what I am. And I understand this is a very wise answer. He is a simple monk. But in general, I said, but his inner being is not a simple monk. It's something else. He's a master. But he was very centered. Not to boast about himself. Because that's wrong. To say, oh, I am the master such and such. All my inner being is from this, from that. Why? 
What do we need to talk about that? The master needed to talk about it because the hu humanity needed to receive the doctrine. And that we are delivering. So we don't need to. Or in special cases, like in this case that I'm telling you, you can also experience the aims of Keter, Chochma, Bina, and all the sephir of the tree of life if you meditate. Why? Because all of us are structured in the same way. But uh, there is a tendency of us to idolize too much somebody else. To give, uh, to be uh, uh, with the virtue of gratitude is good. Because we, we have to be grateful. Right? But not to forget yourself. Remember you shall not have any other gods before me, says your Ein Sof, your Ein, your Keter Chokmah Bina inside of you. Meaning that you have to love your inner being and respect the other gods. But first, your inner being. Those that are demanding to more worship to themselves is mythomania. And if you worship them, you feel their mitomania. So you are hurting them. So it's, it, we have to comprehend that in order not to hurt each other. And for that, it, we need to meditate. With this rune, wunjo, there is a practice that the Master Samael gives. And that is fitting exactly the necessity of us to experience through meditation our own particular being or whatever you want to experience or to, or to have experience with. And this is a meditation with a mantra, Wu, W, U, Wu, that sounds, that double O, Wu, that the sounds of the wind. We hold this because really, the run Wunjo is ready with a double U of the Latin alphabet. <coughs> so it, it, it looks like a P in the Latin alphabet, but really is the double U among the runes. So this mantra Wu is very good because it's the mantra that I utilize and I was utilizing in order to experience what I told you, in which your mind talks too much. If you close your eyes to go to meditation, and then your mind starts talking to you. The chat, blah, 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 blah. And, and that's precisely uh, your, your mind talking about, right? Or what about what you read or, or what you said, you remember? And, and given a big scenario in your mind, and then you are wasting your time. You are, of course, with a mudra, the thumb and the finger united in the, that position that is always shown in advertisement, but inside you are making a James Bond movie <laughs> of yourself. <laughs> eh? And instead, the mind is always telling you that you are a hero or a heroine, right? That you are the number one. And meanwhile, you have your close eye, you are relaxed, but you are thinking baloney. So then you have to attack your mind. You want to talk, you want to boast about yourself, do it. But here is the only thing that I want you to pronounce. Woo. Woo. Which is the sound of the hurricane. The sound of the ends of, of the word. Woo. And that is a mantra that acts like a dynamite. That enters into your mind. Thoughts, conversation that comes, analyze them. And understand that your mind is only a vehicle. Your mind is not you. The real you is your being. And your being never boasts about itself because it doesn't need it. The mind is the one that does it. So, yes, woo, in something that said, mind, shut. I don't want to listen to you. Just listen to this. Woo. And like that, remembering your being. 
Because remember that always in Matthew says that when you are meditating, you have to remember yourself. But yourself is not your mind. Your mind is just a parrot, like like to talk too much. And it needs to be silent. When the mind is silent and only who is heard inside of you, then you can concentrate in whatever you want to concentrate and the experience will come as a bliss, as a wound for you. It's a joy, happiness. And this is precisely what we want. In order to have faith. Because faith is that energy that is built after that type of experience. You awake and you have that strength in you. But then you have to comprehend it. And remember that. Don't forget this. Even though it was a teaching for me, it's also for you. Be careful with mythomania. Because when you meditate and you relax, you have beautiful experiences. I, have, I had many experiences with all the sephiroth of the tree of life. But I didn't create the tree of life. It was there before I experienced it. In the same way, so... You, Comprehension is what you need, even after one joy, after one blessed Samadhi, and you remember what you heard or what they teach you, you have to, to analyze that and to comprehend and also put aside your mind and say, mind, this is not your business. You are just a vehicle of mine. But you are not the master. The master is inside. And you are not. And remember that, because along this path, working with the three factors of wunjo, of joy, you will develop. And the ego have always a tendency of talking about. But if it's not necessary to talk about it, just be silent. If it's necessary, then say it. But remember always that you have to meditate after that. Do you have questions? Remember that in the third factor, I am the affir affirmative force. I am teaching. You are the passive. You are receiving. But questions is necessary in order to have comp to be comprehension there, right? Um, this relates to something you were talking about at the beginning of the lecture, where the, the, the Buddha stated that there are three. Permanent things, uh, space, karma, and nirvana. I think Sama said that too. Does that mean that these things exist even during the birth to life? Yeah. The question is, uh, yeah, this, this thing is a space, nirvana, and, and, and karma exist even within the great pralaya? Of course. But we have to understand that uh, the great pralaya or maha pralaya, the great cosmic night, exists in different unities, different parts of the universe, not in a whole. Because when we think, oh, the Mahapralaya, the great cosmic night, we think that the, all the universe is in it, right? No, it's just part. Part, one unit or one group could be in Mahapralaya, while in other parts of the universe is in a, in a Mahamamantara, active. So it's not a, a zero hour, like many people think, that everything will be in repose. Everything, no. Just part of that everything. Like, for instance, right now, we are in our own particular cosmic day, right? We are alive physically. But it doesn't mean that we are going to die at the same date. Some will die soon, another later. So th they will enter in different uh, pralayas, in different times. So the same happening uh, uh, with the universe. Now that karma is, is in suspense when the pralaya starts. It's in suspense because in order for 
the karma to be paid in his, to, in his the cosmic day. The cosmic day exists because of karma, in order to pay what the gods owe or what we owe. So at the end, of course, everything is in repose, but eventually it will be active, and will be active because of karma. They put an example, for instance, among the master monads. The master monads, those monads that created the existential, existential bodies of the being, astral, mental, and causal bodies, but that entered in their development through the spiral path. Because there are two paths in order to pay karma, in order to be free of this universe. We have to pay what we owe. The direct path, which is the doctrine that we teach here in this school, because this school belongs to Samael on Veor, who walks the direct path. So we are following the direct path. And is the way in which we pay what we owe in one life, in the direct path, is very accelerated. But it doesn't mean that all the people that listen to us, every single mona, would follow the direct path. No. Master Samael Veor in Mexico was giving a lecture and said, my doctrine is the doctrine of the direct path because I am a walker of the direct path. But I know, he said, that many among you will take the spiral path. Well, he said, to those that take the spiral path, we had to tell them goodbye. Because I am a walker of the direct path, and I have nothing to do with the spiral. And yes, many Gnostics that reach that level of mastery took the spiral path. And usually those that do that boast about themselves. And whether they take the direct or the spiral path is a way in order to pay karma with the three factors. In the direct path, you work with the three factors every day, every time. But in the spiral path, you work with the three factors very gentle when you want it. You work in this life, for instance, a little bit, you die. Then the, in the golden age, you reincarnate again and you work a little bit in your karma. And like that, through millions of Maha Mamantaras, you go to the absolute. While the walker of the direct path, it goes directly zoom, faster. But that's the way. So every mona has his freedom to pay the karma in one shot in the direct path or in the spiral path. This is up to the will of God, of each one of us. So there are many people that, or we will say many monads, when they reach the mastery, the fifth initiation, they go on the spirals because the direct path is very painful. It's written in the four Gospels. The one that takes the direct path has to renounce to his powers. The one that take the direct path, has to renounce, meaning that all that bliss, that joy, that happiness that the monads of the spiral receive when they enter into the spiral path, the direct path walker renounce to that. Why? Because the Lord will be incarnated into him or her in order to pay that karma with him. The Lord will take that karma into his own flesh. You see, that is precisely what is called uh, the sacrifice of the Lord. It's not by believing in him that the Lord will take the sins of the world. The sins of the world are your own karma. But if you take the direct path, if you take the spiral, the Lord doesn't incarnate. And then uh, the spiral of monads, masters, they don't renounce their powers. They enjoy their powers. 
But the one that is in the direct path enters into his cosmic night, or spiritual night. Has to make his own light. And that's precisely the point. There are others that, uh, monads, that do not want the mastery. And they prefer to pay their karma by annihilating the ego. <coughs> by following the doctrine of the annihilation of the ego. That's called the intermediate path. In which uh, they are not creating the solar bodies, or the existential bodies of the being. Just paying karma by annihilating the ego. It's a path that is very rare because it has many ordeals that we have to pass through. And the other way in order to pay karma is a way that humanity chooses in its billions. Entering into hell. Because hell exists because karma has to be paid. That is the truth. It has a beginning and the end. But every hundred years, you pay a bill in hell. So the masters of karma exist. There are millions of masters of karma because not only this solar system has it. Many solar systems have masters of the law. And they work with the law. And you walk in the direct path. The master of karma are behind you with a whip. Walk. Walk. You choose the path. Walk. Pay what you owe. You take the spiral path. The masters of karma will appear unto you uh, eventually. Is said, okay? Now you have to pay this. Maybe your next life you will pay the other thing. But now you have to suffer a little bit. <laughs> Not too much. Right? And those that never choose the direct or the spiral, that go and they choose the, the path of the, how they call the lunar path, which is held, uh, infernal. They enter the abyss and learn to pay what they owe. That's why there, ex there exists nine layers. Seven main layers in which you pay what you owe. You are, you are entering every layer in every hundred years. A master of the law comes and says, oh, here's another bill that you paid like that until you reach the ninth sphere and it's disintegrated. If you are completely disintegrated, it's because you have no karma to pay. But that dissension is very painful. Because here in this physical world, we are suffering in this day and age, you know that. This planet Earth is suffering physically because of karma. But what we owe is not going to be paid only in this physical level. If we choose to enter into hell, well, Every hundred years, they will, you will pay something of your karma. I got, I got a question. Yes. What about if after hundred years you don't owe anything? Well, uh, when I said every hundred years, I'm not talking about hundred years of the earth physically here. When I say every hundred years, it means that after a certain uh, lives, 108 lives, that you receive in this physical plane in order to choose the path that you want to choose. Whether the spiral, the direct, wherever, or f with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. But if you receive the doctrine, you said, I don't care. I don't want to follow this and that. I just want to live life. I want to, go, to be a good citizen. Then in the last life, the 108th life, you enter into hell in order to pay what you owe. The ordinary people that were good, as you said, endures in hell about 800 years or a thousand as much in order to pay what they owe and be disintegrated. But it depends the amount of karma that you have in order to endure in every circle the time. With your soul, of course. We're talking about the soul here. We're not talking about the physical body. So every hundred years, we pay a certain amount of karma that we owe. And we were good people, as you said, that we were not doing too, too, 
much bad in this world when a uh, hundred years you pay uh, the whole thing. Let me ask you this. 800. So to avoid that. To avoid what? This, uh, this sanction into hell. Yeah. You raise your Kundalini's. Yes. In order to avoid that, you have to choose the way in order to pay you what you owe by your own will. And you said, I don't want to pay in a mechanical manner in hell the karma that I owe. I want to pay it by my own will. And for that, you have to enter into initiation. The initiation is applied and uh, accommodated to you according to your own karma. Then you have to pay that in different steps. Through the initiations, nine initiations of minor mysteries, and seven initiations of major mysteries, major mysteries. And that way you are paying. And at a certain level, you have to reach the fifth initiation in which you have to choose how to pay what you owe in the spiral way or in the direct way. That's another thing. But first, you have to work with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness in order to pay what you owe. Chastity, annihilation of the ego, which is the cause of karma, and sacrifice for humanity. Right yeah. there, yeah. Does the walker of the spiral path have to eventually enter into the direct to enter into the absolute? Not necessarily. But the problem is that those walkers of the spiral path, when they return in every reincarnation, have the danger of falling. Because the mind, because the table, you know? The table can say, okay, I am the one. And the Bodhisattva can fall. That's the problem for the walkers of the spiral. The Master Samael stated, only those that have strong will, power, never fall in every reincarnation. But usually the human soul, you know, with the mind, the mind uh, gets in love uh, and fornicates, and then he loses everything. And that happens with many walkers of the spiral path. There may be masters of the spiral that have a strong will and never fall. But very rare. The spiral path is the path of the Hanas Musen. Because anybody is a Hanas Mus as long as he has ego. Even if he's at 3%, he's a Hanas Mus. Only those that have no ego, 100%, are no Hanas Mus. Hanas Musen. So, and sometimes they are in danger of falling into double center of gravity. Like the case of Andramelech. He's a master. And his inner being sent him to continue his work. And the soul, the human soul, started practicing black magic. And now that master has the problem that the soul is a master of the black latch, and he is a master of the white latch, double center of gravity. It's one of the heads of the Hanas Mus, of the Hanas Muslim. Another question? Okay. Um, what about if you are on the path and run out of lives? Do you still have to go to hell? What about if you are in the path and you run out of lives? Out of lives among the 108 lives. Well, let me tell you one thing that we have to understand, comprehend. 108 lives are only for the intellectual animals, meaning for those that do not have any existential body. It is enough to create the astral body in order to be out of that 108 lives. So if you create a hundred in, uh, uh, your astral body, then you enter, of course, under other laws. It doesn't mean that you cannot enter into hell. 
you still can go down, but not by the 108 lives or lives that is given to any soul, to any essence. And uh, if you enter into the path and you are in your 108, still the masters of the law can give you 109, 110, 111 in order for you to do because you have the will to do it. But if you are young, believe me, if you practice the three factors, you can create at least the astral body. And then you are out of the 108. Other lives will get you but if you don't behave, you can go also to hell. Because the case of Andromelek, for instance, is in hell. And he is a fallen throne. So the danger of falling into hell is always exists, as long as we have ego, and if we are not serious. But if we are serious, it doesn't matter if we finished a 108 life as intellectual animals. Because then the, the law can give us 109, 110, etc. In order to keep ahead in the work that we are performing and doing. Another question? Um, to be loyal to one's guru, what does that encompass? And is it better maybe not to follow any teacher besides our own? To be loyal to our own guru means to Samael on the or. <coughs> because he is the guru of the Gnostics. That's why the books exist. This is why he wrote his books. The doctrine is there in order for us to follow it. Below him, we are dif there in different initiates in different levels. But we have ego. And if you want to be loyal to your instructor, or to the guru that is teaching you, you have to understand that he has ego. And that everything that he says has to be meditated, analyzed. Has to be corroborated by the teachings of the Master Samael on the Or. Because there are many there that reach the level of mastery and they're teaching something that doesn't go with what the Master taught. So that's why we always advise. That's why we translated the books of the Master Samael on the Lord. Otherwise, we will teach only in English and say, follow us. This is what the Master Samael taught. No, we translate all the books. Read the books, study the books, because he is the guru, the guruji, or guruji, as we say in Sanskrit, of the Gnostics. And all of us below are doing our effort to guide you but remember, for instance, in my case, I have ego. My being is great. It's powerful. But is, that is he. I am not. I am the table. It says, be careful with mythomania. And I have to be careful with that. And uh, those that are not careful, well, likes to be worshipped. Only God has to be worshipped. And of course, we have to be faithful to our own guru. To be grateful. For instance, the instructor that teaches you, be grateful to that instructor. Not because he is master or because he is not, but because you have to, to develop that virtue of, of gratitude. Right? And remember, that is the third factor. We always ask for you for donations in our lectures and in the website. And people say, why are you asking? Because I want, or we want you to advance. If you don't give, you don't receive. We give you the opportunity to give in order to advance. Remember, love is, con is love, but conscious love. We will say, I said, why don't we get a, a loan in the bank of hundred thousand dollars and we do what we have to do and forget about the Gnostics. They never <coughs> give. Who can do that and make the great business? But I said, no. Let us then give. And to, they had to teach. They had to learn that they had to give also. Because if we do that and then we will take all the Dharma for us. 
You will sit in there receiving the lectures, practicing the, the exercises, but you don't give anything. You will be steinered because you have to pay what you owe. We can do that, and then all the Dharma will be for us, and we will go like rockets. <laughs> but no, we have to give you the opportunity too, you know what I mean? Right? For you to help. I got a question. Yeah? I, you keep, keep saying following gurus, and, but even all, all the books in the back, the books the master, you all do not follow me, I'm just a signpost. Right? Just reach your own self-realization. So what does it mean by a signpost? Just the uh, tools that we have? A signpost? Well, the master says, I am only a signpost. He's talking about his mind. He's talking about his personality at that time. Because that's precisely the, the, the question here. When the, I met the master physically in Mexico, I already saw him and met him many times in the internal planes. So I knew who he was. When I met his personality, his physical body in Mexico, I knew that one thing was a physical body, that personality, and another thing was his inner being. So when I said I follow Zamai Lombeor, I'm talking about the logos, talking about that being without ego. I'm not talking about the personality that existed because that personality was disintegrated, burned to ashes, and was the one that says I am only a post. At that time, when the master wrote that, he was dealing with his ego, and he was isolated and hidden. Why? Because the Lord said, if we allowed you to see all the students every day, you will feed your pride because they love you very much. So the master allowed us to see him physically when his ego was completely annihilated. And even though in that time he was meditating hours and hours before that congress that we have in Guadalajara in 1976, why was he meditating when he, he didn't have ego anymore? Because he says, I want to meditate and not, not to be in the danger of building again what I annihilated. Because I know that Gnostic is coming here and they love the doctrine and they love my being. And if I am not aware, I will build again the ego of pride. So he was really acting always very conscious in the at that time, in order not to build his body, because one is always in the danger, especially if somebody is praising you. And then the ego of pride goes very fat. Mm -hmm. So that's why at that time, the master says, I am a signpost. It's true, because the Bodhisattva is only a signpost, somebody that delivers the doctrine, the knowledge. But sooner or later, we die, we disappear. Or otherwise, we will fall in the mistake of the, of Christianity in this day and age, that still are worshipping the personality of Master Jesus and interpreting the Bible according to the life of Master Jesus 2,000 years ago and thinking that because they believe in that personality, they are saved. We want to fall in the same mistake and the Master understood that. That he didn't want it, our, our, the Gnostics to fall into that mistake. Or to thinking that if we worship him, we are going to enter into heaven. Now it's a work. And if he comes unto us and helps us, well, we have to deserve it. But remember that that signpost is the Bodhisattva. And when I said we follow Samael, I'm talking about the Logos. And for that, you need to experience as well, to meditate and to comprehend what is that in order to have the certainty of saying it. When we say that we have to follow him, we're not saying his personality or his photograph. Even though we can have a photograph in order to remember where, what he was in, 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 when he was alive in Mexico. But one thing is Samael, and another thing is Samael on the or. And another thing was the physical body that existed at that time. So please comprehend that, understand that, because it's, it's necessary in order to be uh, faithful to the Guru, the Guruji, Samael on the Or, and to be grateful to the instructor that teaches you, 
because if you are grateful to the instructor that teaches you, you are helping that instructor to help. Help to help your instructor. And that's the main thing here. But remember that as long as we are alive, egotistically speaking, we don't deserve praises. Only God deserves praises. Another question? Is it necessary to have the mind completely silenced in order to meditate on the ego? I am not there yet. It isn't necessary to have the, the mind in blank in order to comprehend the ego? Silence. To be completely silenced? No. No. <coughs> Only in the higher levels. When you start comprehending your ego, you start comprehending your ego in the intellectual level. You start using your intellect and analyzing things. But after you comprehend it at that level, you have to go deep in another level, and another level, and another level. There will be the time in which you want to even to grasp the, that deep, how you might it call the significance of that that you are meditating. But in order to trap the deep significance that you are meditating, yes, you have to enter beyond the 49 levels of the mind. But when you are starting, don't think that you have to be in silence of the mind in order to comprehend an ego. That will be absurd. The silence comes when you comprehend, when you analyze, but be always attentive. Because during the comprehension of one ego, other egos are talking to your ear. This is what happened to me. I am analyzing very well, concentrated in one particular ego. And all of a sudden, I hear another ego talking, trying to take my attention to other things. And I say, I don't care about it. I want just to comprehend this. And I'm analyzing myself, utilizing, of course, the process of comprehension in relation with what I am analyzing. But to expect that I have to be completely in silence. Well, if I wait that, I will fall asleep first. And maybe I will forget about it. Because there are too many egos. When you start, you have a lot. But of course, if you have the ability to reach first the silence of the mind, when you bring that ego in order to be analyzed, that ego is your mind. And then you will start talking. No more silence for you. <laughs> I am here. Yeah. Uh, not being clairvoyant, is there any possibility to know the state of our karma? Clairvoyance uh, is active in each one of us in different levels. Imagination is the same clairvoyance. And in order to know about in which uh, way, in which level is your karma, you then practice the mantra, Mu, meditate in that, and pray to your inner God, my Father, my God, show me, please, my karma. And if you are well concentrated, your being will bring you the experience in order to show you your karma. And clairvoyance or intuition or polyvoyance, whatever, will be developed during that samadhi. Because in any samadhi, the chakra sahasrara enters into activity, and all the chakras. And then you see what you need to see. That brings into my mind another experience that is very funny, that happens to me. There were certain doubts <laughs> about my behavior in relation with something which is related with my private life. So certain master came in the astral plane to talk to me about it. And then I was discussing with the master and said, well, this and this and this happened, and, and this is precisely the truth. But in that moment when I was talking, I felt the pressure of my being from above, entering and giving me super lucidity, what I always would like to have. Mm -hmm. I was really, with all my chakras in, active, in activity, and I was aware of the astral plane in a hundred percent. And I was really marveled. And then the master that was questioning me was looking in at my eyes. And then he saw my inner being. And then he says, okay, I understand. And, 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 
the master withdrew. Then I was screaming in the astral plane to my inner being, please, I promise you that if you keep me in this way, I will be good. <laughs> hey? Don't take that from me. I promise you. And I was kneeled. And that was taken a little by little, little by little. I said, no. And what's the screaming? Please, I promise you. <laughs> Obviously, he didn't trust me. <laughs> he, took, he took everything. And I was again at the same level. I said, okay. When I walk, I said, I understand. You don't trust me. And believe me, if I am my father, I wouldn't trust me too. <laughs> said, I have to die because God don't give his powers to the devil. And who the devil? I was the devil. I am the devil. Right? So when you enter in Samadhi, your being gives you in that moment what you need. In order to experience what you need. But after that, he takes his powers to the devil. He says, now the devil has to die. And that's precisely what happened. So don't worry about I am not clairvoyant. I am not intuitive. Because in the moment when you need that, your being will give you that. If you deserve it. But as I, in my case, even if you scream, he will give you. <laughs> no more questions? No. Well, <laughs> go ahead and practice your woo. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.